As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship. Amen. Amen. All righty. If you have your booklet from last week, you remember that we are going to spend at least three Wednesdays in this booklet, Level 3, Book 4, Victory Over Sin. And uh, I hope you're paying attention not just to learn the content, but so that at some point, if you have the opportunity to help a new believer grow, that you'll know what you're doing because you are uh, practiced in this in, in uh, these these booklets. And uh, I got to sit in a session yesterday uh, taught by the man who wrote these booklets, Pastor John Wilkerson, and. Uh, gave further instruction, not so much on the individual booklets, but how to use them, how to disciple people, and what the, what the idea is. And if we ever became a church that masters this concept of discipleship, we would see God transform lives beyond. Uh, I, I read years ago that if you want your church to add people, win souls. But if you want your church to multiply win souls and disciple them because discipleship multiplies. And uh, so please take this seriously. I don't just mean this lesson tonight, but the whole process. Take it seriously and ask the, ask the Lord, ask the Lord to make us not just a church that wins souls, but a church that disciples new believers and helps them to grow in the Lord. All right, so let's quickly just hit the high points of last week, the, and uh, then we'll go. Uh, last week, we answered two questions, and tonight, we're going to answer the next two major questions. So, first of all, what is sin? Number one, sin is a violation of God's law, page two. Number two, sin is missing the mark of divine perfection. Number three, sin is described as rebellion. Number four, sin is anything that is not faith. Then, where does sin come from? Number one, sin comes from our hearts. Number two... Sin is inherited from Adam. So these are the questions that we answered last week, and uh, we'll see how far we get tonight. I'm not trying to rush this, and uh, so if we have to take our time to just get through one major point and see the scriptures, that is fine. But the question we're going to look at tonight is, what is the nature of sin? In other words, so we've got this thing that will destroy us. The Bible says sin when it is finished bringeth forth death, has it work? What does the Bible say we should expect from this thing called sin, all right? Number one, you can turn to Genesis chapter 3. Number one, sin is deceitful. The very fact that you're sitting there tonight thinking, wow, it's sin, that's no big deal, that's a joke. I heard them make jokes about sin on Saturday Night Live. You know, I hear them joke about it on sitcoms all the time. That's a joke. You've been deceived already. Sin is deceitful. It is a poison that will destroy your life. And it's crazy how people mock. The Bible says fools make a mock at sin. And people make a mock of sin and say it's no big deal. And then when sin destroys their marriage, then they blame God. And God warns you. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so sin is nothing to be trifled with. It will destroy your life. Genesis 3, verse number 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, this is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God had said, of all the fruit of the trees of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, 
except for this one tree in the middle of the garden. In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Bible doesn't say how long, but they, they lived there for some time. Some think it may have been on the first day. I don't believe it was on the first day. I believe over a process of time, they kept their distance. And then one day she was walking too close to that tree, the tree of the knowledge of, the good, of good and evil. And Satan was there in, for, in the form of a serpent. Now, don't try to explain that or figure that one out. There, there's no miracle in the Bible that you can figure out outside of God. People say, oh, sure, yeah, a talking snake. How, how, how did that work? It, it worked the way everything that in the supernatural works. And so Satan told Eve, God's lying to you. He didn't start out saying God's lying to you. He start, let's go ahead and read the whole thing. This, verse 1, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he, subtle, how? Does that mean that, that you know, snakes are, are uh, you know, all snakes are sneaky? Well, yes, it does. They're evil, for crying out loud. But, but no, a subtle is talking about the fact that, you know, a buffalo wasn't going to just show up and, and sneak up on Eve. She was going to see him coming. But a snake, he can just get in there and all of a sudden just appear out of nowhere. And Satan knew that. He knew that he was going to use the creature that was, was going to be the easiest to sort of whisper in her ear. And so he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, and that's where God, that's, I'm sorry, that's where sin starts right there. Did God really say that? Think about the things that you've grown up or you've heard in church are off limits. And some person, even some person that claims to be a preacher, you know, of the, and if this is a real name of a church, it's a real name of about a thousand churches, but some, some minister that looks like he's on his way to go fishing and he pastors the river church, uh, you know, he says, did God really say that? Now, again, if you know a church called the, God bless you, I'm not talking about a particular church. I'm just saying, you know, the names are getting nuts. The, the light bulb church, you know, whatever. But, but he comes out, did God really say that? And Paul said, no marvel, Satan's ministers appear as, as angels of light. They look like the good guys, but they come along and say, did God really say that? Anytime somebody says, did God really say, does the Bible really say that? Be careful. That's the first step Satan went down, uh, to took her down. And um, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The fact is, God had not said that. God said, ye may eat of every tree of the garden. Just don't, don't eat of that one. Satan misquoted him and said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Oh, he said it's close enough. I know. That's what they say about all the modern 450 English versions of the Bible. It's close enough. Close enough is not what God said. So God said, ye shall eat of every tree except that one. Satan said, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree. Where God was showing boundaries for their own safety, Satan was showing them, God's holding you back. He always paints an opposite picture from what God paints. Verse 2, the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the true fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat it, eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, wait a second. Now, she's playing the changing God's word game because God never said you can't touch it. I don't think it would have been a good idea. You know, to, to pick a fruit of the tree. By the way, I don't think it was an apple. The Bible never says it's an apple. But uh, I know that's the tradition there. But, but I think it was a peach because I hate peaches. But anyway, but um, I don't think it would have been a good idea to pick a piece of throat, fruit and play, uh, you know, play catch with it. But God didn't say you couldn't touch it. He said, don't eat of it. 
Verse, uh, verse number four. So Satan talks back. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. Well, now he just called God a liar. God did say in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall die in chapter two. Now Satan says, ye shall not surely die. God's lying to you. So he began by questioning God's word. And now he's just straight up calling God a liar. Hey, the world is full of voices telling us that God's lying to us. And you're going to decide whether you believe God or whether you believe those voices. Sin will tell you every time, ye shall not surely die. God says, sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Sin says, no, you, you're not going to die. That's, that's metaphorical. It's not so bad. It's, it's not a big deal. For God doth know, verse number five, God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open. Now, here's the thing about Satan's lies. There's always a little bit of truth in it. Their eyes were open. But their eyes were open to all of the ways that they could commit more sin. Wouldn't it be great if there was only one rule to keep in life? Oh, my soul. They only had one rule to keep. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. But because they ate the fruit of the tree, yes, their eyes were opened. And all of a sudden, oh, there's all these things we're not supposed to be doing. Their eyes were opened to sin. And here's the great temptation of Satan because it's the same thing that he set out to do. Now he's trying to sell it to them. Ye shall be as gods. See, God doesn't, this is Satan telling Eve, God doesn't want any competition. That's why he said don't eat because if you eat of that fruit, you'll be like God. So Satan said, don't be trapped by this Almighty Creator, be your own God. And you know what the lost world is daily trying to do? To be their own God. Is, isn't it, it's so heartbreaking, the theories and the philosophies that people will come up with to explain away life, to get through life. But the one thing they will not believe is they will not believe the God of the Bible. It is amazing if you read uh, some versions of, of science and they come up with these elaborate explanations for the, the, the um, I'm trying to think of the phrase that, that, uh, that I, I read, the, the, oh, the method, the ways of evolution, the methods, and you step in, whoa, 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 wait a second. You're giving divine planning power to evolution. How can evolution have a way if it's random? They're talking about the, the consistent patterns of things evolving on their own by random chance. No. If you take your car to the mechanic tomorrow because all of a sudden it's not, you know, you buy a new car and then all of a sudden it's the, the, your combustible engine just isn't firing right. And you take it in and Eric takes a look at it and he comes out and says, uh, craziest thing, the laws of nature that make the combustible engine work they changed. <laughs> yeah. Call a lawyer right away. Because <laughs> somebody, somebody in the shop is lying to you. We all count on the laws of nature every day. And if somebody tells us otherwise, well, they've changed. That's why the lights won't come on. That's why your warranty is, isn't, we, we won't accept it because the laws of nature changed. What? No. We know that things are going to work and work and work day after day, year after year, because there's order. There is a design. But, but, but science that wants to, by the way, there's plenty of science that embraces God. 
that interprets evidence through the eyes of, yes, there has to be a God. But there is also science that interprets every piece of evidence as there's no God. And every little discovery they make, they try to put it into the there's no God puzzle. There's no such thing as an objective scientist in either direction. Except I've never heard or read of anybody who set out into the field of science and came to the conclusion there can't possibly be a, be a God. Oh, he's probably out there somewhere. I'm talking about that scientist. He's probably out there somewhere. But I've got book after book after book on my shelf by men who set out to use science to disprove God. And they wound up believing God and trusting Christ as their Savior. And now they've written books on, yeah, uh, Darwin, nice guy, but didn't know what he's talking about. Impossible. His theory's impossible. Didn't plan, plan to go down that road, but here's, 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 here's my point. It is a tragedy how people who, who refuse, I do not want God to run my life. And they will bend over backwards and twist themselves in knots trying to explain why things are the way they are in this world. And pretty soon they're saying things like karma. Wait, karma? What's karma? Well, you know, it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just the order. There's order, but the God of the Bible can't possibly be the creator. That's Satan telling us. And I'm telling you right now, we're not getting past this first question, all right? So don't worry about the clock, however long it takes. It takes. We'll, we'll be done at 845. But that's what, that's what Satan does. That's what sin does. And I guess by definition, sin is not Satan. Is Satan is not sin. But they are inseparable. We're talking about heads and tails of the same coin. The methods of sin are the, met, are the methods of Satan and vice versa. So, Satan says, ye shall be in, as gods. Every new avenue of sin that you choose to go down, you do so because you're choosing to try to be your own God. Don't tell me not to drink that. Don't tell me not to smoke that. Don't tell me not to look at that. Don't tell me not to, not to embrace that lifestyle. I will decide. You're saying, just like Eve said, I'll be my own God. Don't you dare tell me what to do. I'll be my own God. And that's the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives us by appearing desirable. Hebrews chapter 3, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Jeremiah 17, 9, you all know this verse. The heart is deceitful above all things. The human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's sort of like one of the great ironic questions of the Bible. Your heart is deceitful, deceitful and how can you even know if your heart is lying to you because the transmitter and the receiver are the same heart? So you can't even discern, oh, yes, I'm lying to myself. <laughs> Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Sin is deceitful. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 25. This is talking about Moses, and we're not going to get into an in-depth discussion about Moses, but there's one phrase in here that you need to see. Moses, it says of Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures of sin for a season. Yes, everything that sin offers you is pleasurable. Even though I can't imagine, I, I can't, I, I can't conceive and if you're a smoker I'm not I'm not getting on you but I'm just saying I can't conceive what's pleasurable about taking the first puff of a cigarette but uh, they I guess once you once you get that taste for nicotine it's one of the hardest things to, to let go of but everything that is out of bounds has an element of pleasure to it but here's the difference listen carefully to this 
the difference between sin and righteousness and how it affects you is sin, you enjoy it up front and you pay for it for years to come. Righteousness, you pay for it up front. And then you enjoy the benefits of it for years to come. The Bible says, wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no part to it? Even wisdom has a price tag. The price tag is in chapter 18, verse 1. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. You got to want it. You got to separate yourself unto it, which means away from everything that contradicts it. Then you've got to search for it every day, and you've got to intermeddle, means uh, 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 interact with everything having to do with it. That's the price tag of wisdom. If you'll pay that price up front, it'll pay you back the rest of your life. Sin, you enjoy it. For I heard, I heard a, a famous musician many years ago uh, talking about his drug habit. And he said, you know, that, that first high is great. He said, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to get that first high. You never get it. No matter what you snort, no matter what, you, what pills you swallow, no matter what you inject in your arm, he said, you never get. He said, and that's why drugs escalate. Because you're, you're looking for a, a way to, to get that first high, and you never get it. That's, that's what sin does. It, it gives you such a pleasure up front that you say, oh, i got to do that again. And pretty soon you're addicted to whatever that sin is, and then you're paying for it for years and years and years to come. Righteousness is the opposite, okay? Number two, sin is powerful. I said first, it says first sin is deceitful. Secondly, sin is powerful. Let's turn over to Psalm 19 and look at that. Now, don't worry, we're only going to number three here and we'll be done, so... <clears throat> But you got to admit, these are important things to look at in the Bible. Psalm 19. Psalm 19. It's, it's a heartbreak to see people and meet people that regret the choices they made when they were younger and now they've been paying for it for decades. And here's another part of the deceitful of sin. Well, I won't have to. I'll beat it. I won't, I won't have to pay for it. No, you always pay for it. Psalm 19, verse 13. David's praying. He says, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Sin is powerful. Sin, David is begging God to keep him from sin so that sin won't overpower him. And man, David's great sin, he paid for it for, he paid for, it for the rest of his life. Yeah, sin is powerful. Turn to Proverbs chapter 5, just a few pages over. We are approaching the end. Less than five minutes to go. Proverbs chapter 5. And verse number 22. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself. Who's the his? The wicked. The wicked, let, let's put the antecedent in, in place of the pronoun. The wicked man's own iniquities shall take the wicked himself. And he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. Man, sin is powerful. When we believe Satan's lies, we are overcome by the power of sin. Sin is deceitful, sin is powerful. Thirdly, sin is destructive. Turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. at verse number 28, Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 28. I'm still turning and your pages have stopped. Good for you. I mean, good job. That's what I meant. Good job. Yeah, Isaiah 1, 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Sin will destroy you. This is not a guilt trip. 
This is just a Bible warning. Don't let sin destroy you. Last verse, John chapter 10. Turn over to John chapter 10. And verse number 10. John chapter 10, verse number 10. The thief, and it's talking about Satan, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Satan to destroy you. Here's the thing. We started out saying sin is deceitful. The very fact that you've got it in your head that God's trying to hold you back from all the fun. I heard uh, Brother Eddie Lapina say years ago, and I've visited this quote again and again. Far too many Christians think that the, the world's having a party and they're not invited. The whole world's just having the time of their lives. You know, why don't we remember the people who stood on a stage or stood in front of a camera and made us think the party life was the way to go? And then they overdosed or they shot themselves in the head. I'll never forget riding home from uh, Powerhouse in uh, a Heritage Baptist Church one year. I don't know how many years ago it was, but we had just been in a session where they were preaching against sin and got in the car, and I don't even think I was getting news from my phone. That's how long ago it was. I don't know. I, maybe it's not as long as I thought, but I turned on the radio probably to get a sports score, and the headline was that Robin Williams had had hung himself. And I remember in, in a, in a, in a uh, car full of, or a van full of teenagers thinking, man, you know, here's a guy that, that spent, and God bless him, I'm not ripping on him. I, he's the one I picked. I could have picked dozens of different entertainers. But here's, by the way, he made a mock of God. He mocked God every chance he got. He mocked morality every chance he got. And Made everybody think that his lifestyle was the fun one. Made everybody laugh. Now, after he took his own life, it's discovered by people that knew him. He was one of the saddest people behind the scenes. I'm not picking on Robin Williams. I'm saying the world is lying to us, folks. The world is lying to us. Sin lies to us. Satan lies to us. Sin is deceitful. It's powerful. It's destructive. The last statement, the destructiveness of, destructiveness of sin complicates our lives and the lives of those around us and we'll take that into next week and we'll we'll pick up next week with what should i do when i sin let's stand together i heard a preacher say yesterday and this is this is uh i wrote in the back of my bible but i left my bible uh in the house this is a different bible but uh he said, after you get saved, you have a new landlord, but Satan's still going to come try to collect the rent. Think about that one. Oh, I'm saved now. I'm not supposed to sin. Yeah, you're right, but he's still going to try to come get you and uh, don't believe his lies. Father, I pray tonight. Thank you for everyone who's here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we had together to pray and to seek your face and to look into the Bible. And Lord, I would much rather talk about grace and mercy and the love of God. But, Lord, I'm not doing my job if we don't look and see what the Bible has to say about sin. Because sin will destroy any person in this room who believes it's lies. And so I pray that you'd help us. Bless as we go. Keep us safe as we travel home. And, Lord, bless every marriage represented in this room. Bless every, every, every family, every home represented in this room. Help us, Lord, please, as we take on the challenges of life to turn our eyes upon Jesus and go through these things in the power of of the Savior. Bless as we go. Thank you for your love, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.